Good afternoon, officially, and welcome to uh, Ohio State's Arts and Sciences uh, Science Sundays series. I'll try to say that fast. So the Science Sunday series has been going on for several years now. We meet about eight times a year. It's sponsored by eight centers across the arts and sciences and, and actually a little bit beyond. And what we do is we offer free public lectures, just like this one, on a variety of exciting t science topics. So everybody gets a chance to find out about the great research that's being done at Ohio State and by our friends around the world. So today is no exception. I guess everybody's heard a little bit about gravitational waves. Yes? Okay. You felt the disturbance in the force? <laughs> so uh, my name is John Beacom. I'm the director of the Center for Cosmology and Astroparticle Physics, or CCAP. C-C-A-P-P, -P. and I'm uh, head of one of these eight centers, and today I'm the host of uh, Professor Lara Cadenati. So I've had the privilege to know her for um, almost 20 years, and she uh, began her career with her uh, graduate work at Princeton. She was a postdoc at MIT, then she was faculty at UMass, and for the past few years she's been faculty at Georgia Tech. Now throughout the last, how many years, about a decade? About a decade, she's been part of the LIGO scientific collaboration, and she actually has a very important role in that collaboration that I hope she'll mention um, during the talk when she's talking about the events. It's a very big collaboration, so um, we're very privileged to have her as one of those leading representatives. So almost without further ado, we'll welcome Laura, and then I want to tell you that afterwards, we'll have questions. We'll have a good period for questions at the end, and the rules on questions are, the first three or four questions, if you are under 18, you get first priority, okay? So the, actually, the younger you are, the higher the priority you get. So get your questions ready, young people. Then um, afterwards, there's a reception with uh, nice food and drink, a chance to talk to the speaker directly, and a chance to ask questions about things you've always wanted to know about. So without further ado, let's welcome uh, Professor Catanati. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, wow, I'm impressed. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me uh, to give this lecture and for attending. Uh, it's always uh, a privilege and a honor uh, for me to be able to talk about uh, the discovery of gravitational waves, uh, which uh, is the combined work of about a thousand scientists over the course of many decades. Um, so, so I hope you enjoy uh, the lecture. If you uh, walk outside in the night on a, on a clear evening and uh, there isn't much light pollution and you look up with a very, very sharp eyesight, uh, this is what, what you can see. Uh, this is an image from uh, the Hubble telescope, actually. Uh, the Hubble telescope has been orbiting around Earth since the 90s and has been sending us images of the universe and distant galaxies. A lot has been uh, learned uh, since uh, uh, Galileo 400 years ago first pointed the telescope at the skies. Um, we now know that the universe is not that quiet, stationary, uh, peaceful uh, uh, setting that uh, uh, the ancient Greeks uh, wrote about. Uh, we know that there are uh, all sorts of things going on. There are galaxies, there are um, uh, collisions, there are strong emissions of energy, and we know all of this by using the information from electromagnetic waves. Uh, so we, we use visible light, infrared, x-ray, gamma rays. Uh, it's all uh, information that's coming from electromagnetic waves, which are produced from the oscillation of uh, electric charges. Okay, so this is how we see uh, the universe, how we've been seeing the universe so far. Gravity has been explaining uh, a lot. It explains how the planets move around stars, how galaxies move, uh, and it all uh, started from uh, the universal law of gravitation, uh, Newton's law of gravitation. However, uh, about 100 years ago, Albert Einstein uh, was unsatisfied by the explanation of uh, uh, gravity as a mysterious force between two masses. Uh, we all learned this uh, 
in um, maybe not in grade school, in high school, uh, we learned that two masses attract each other with a force that's proportional to the masses, inversely proportional to the square of the distance. Uh, but there is really no um, explanation of where this mysterious force is coming from. Uh, why is that the case? Uh, one could say, okay, it's fundamental. But uh, the one thing that was disturbing us and the most is that gravity is, uh, uh, according to uh, gravitation, is actually the distance. Which means if uh, uh, two uh, mass if massive bodies change their configuration or uh, say the sun were to be taken away by a cosmic magician, instantaneously uh, the effect of gravity would change without any delay. So a cosmic magician takes the sun away and Earth goes in orbit even before the light switches off. So there was an inconsistency, there was no messenger for the information of gravitational uh, fields and uh, gravity itself. So Einstein uh, recast, redescribed gravity not in terms of a mysterious force, but as a geometrical property of space and time. So this is, uh, we saw before how we see the universe with stars and galaxies using electromagnetic radiation. This is the universe according to general relativity. It's actually a simplified version, it's a two-dimensional version of the universe where now uh, space is uh, distorted by large masses. And so uh, we see, we see uh, planets, we see stars, and uh, the heavier the object, the more dense, the more the deformation of space and of time that's produced by massive objects. And so a planet is rotating around the sun, Earth is rotating around the sun because it's moving on a curved surface. Okay, so masses modify space, and the curvature of space determines how masses move. That's a, that's a very uh, simplified, if you want, my cartoonish description of general relativity. If you look very carefully, back here there is a funnel. So that's, that's a black hole according to general relativity. It's a distortion of space-time that's so big, this, this, this deviation goes so deep that even light cannot climb out. And so, uh, mathematically, we can describe a black hole like a singularity or, or a, a hole that's pinched into the fabric of space-time. Okay, so this is our new way of, of looking at gravity. Part of the theory is also introducing the concept of a messenger or how does information get carried. So this is where gravitational waves are coming into play. Gravitational waves are distortions or ripples in this uh, fabric of space-time, in this, uh, in this uh, set of lines that I, I showed you over here, that is produced whenever large masses accelerate and change their configuration. So if we have uh, two black holes that smash against each other, we have two funnels that go into a single funnel, and that change produces some perturbation in space-time, which propagates at the speed of light. So the gravitational waves are now the messenger for the, the, what tells us, hey, something changed over there. The gravitational field from uh, those stars, from those black holes has changed. Adjust yourself accordingly. And it manifests as these ripples in space-time itself. So space is not flat, it squiggles. And those are the effects that we're going after. So these were predicted uh, in 1916 by Einstein, and LIGO announced the discovery that measurements of this uh, effect 100 years later, which is a very fortunate coincidence. Uh, we all like coincidences, right? Okay, so um, one example, so to produce gravitational waves, we need to have acceleration of masses. So if we have two compact objects, so two neutron stars or two black holes that are rotating around each other, that's an accelerated motion. So these two black holes rotate around each other, and as they do so, they uh, change their gravitational field, they start distorting space-time and produce these ripples, this wave that propagate outwards. As they propagate outwards, they carry energy away from the system, and so these two are gonna get closer and closer until eventually they're gonna collide into each other. So that's what we describe as a collision of two black holes or two compact objects in general. So this is the crown, uh, the crown signature, the one that's best understood and the one that uh, LIGO was built to go after and detect. Um, so just to give you another example, so as, as these waves propagate and the space-time curves, what's changing is that the distance between two points changes. 
So the physical effect that we want to go after is a change in distances. Okay, so that's how we can go after detecting gravitational waves. Um, to do an analogy, when you take a stone and you throw it in the water, it's going to make ripples, they're going to propagate outwards. Okay, so this is a similar concept. So, but now instead of the surface of a lake, we have the fabric of space time. So this is another cartoon that's showing you how different uh, the effect of uh, an ocean wave or a surface wave is from the effect of a gravitational waves. So if you take a boat and you put it on, on, a, on, a, on sea waves, it's going to rock, right? And it can rock in one direction or the other direction, so it's following the motion of the water. If a gravitational wave goes through the boat itself, instead the effect is going to be to deform it, to change the very definition of distance in the various configurations, the various direction. And so instead of having the same object rocking, we're going to get deformation uh, in, uh, in the shape itself. So it's an intrinsic change in the definition of distance. That's what we're going after. So why is it important to do that? Um, so many of us have been going after the detection of gravitational waves, first of all, because it's always nice to get confirmation to a theory. That's a prediction of relativity that was not directly measured yet. But the other thing, part of the reason why this is uh, such a breakthrough discovery, it's actually, it's giving us this new set of information uh, that's the equivalent of when uh, movies went from being silent to have audio. So we are going to have a new sense to explore the universe that's going to carry more information. That's now coming from the motion of masses as opposed to oscillation of charges. Uh, so in this, uh, in this animation, this is... Uh, an animation that I really like because it shows, you know, say you want to understand the jungle and you get a silent movie of the jungle. So you can see there are waterfalls, there is green, but you don't know what else is happening inside the jungle itself. Now we turn up the volume and we hear monkeys, we hear birds. These are the monkeys. We get a better sense of the force that's coming in waterfall because we kind of get that extra information, right? Lots of water flowing down. And sometimes we have some surprises for things we didn't know were there. Okay, so now we have turned on the volume. What we want to go is to see if there's some surprise expecting us in the universe. So uh, last September, September 14, 2015, uh, something happened. Uh, the, I think I've just lost the, uh, oh no, okay, it's gonna come. Uh, we, we detected uh, for the first time a gravitational wave that was produced from the collision of two black holes. So now I wanna walk you through the journey of this gravitational wave that we detected a year and a half ago now. So what you see here is a simulation, numerical simulation of the collision of two black holes. So these are the two black holes that were uh, 30, 40 times the mass of the sun. And as you see, they get closer and closer. This is the, it's a slow down, uh, it's slowed down by a factor of 20, 30. And you see at the end, we're left with a big black hole. But we, we have no way to see this happening. So this happened 1.3 billion years ago. This is a simulation, numerical simulation, of what happens to space-time as the two black holes uh, collided into each other. So the green trace is a simulation of the gravitational wave that ripples. Most of it was produced at the final instance of the collision. And then the ripple propagates outwards at the speed of light through the universe surrounding it. So there we go. Then we fast forward 1.3 billion years. So that's about uh, the age of life on Earth. And then we see the wave reached Earth. So these are the various uh, wave fronts that reach Earth. Up until the, the big burp, uh, the final burp uh, reached us. And there it is. We all had a little jiggle dance. Okay. <laughs> Um, now, this has been extremely exaggerated. I don't think anybody felt the wiggle uh, a year and a half uh, ago. I was, uh, was fast asleep at that point. Um, I, didn't I didn't find out until a couple of hours later. Uh, my colleagues in Europe found out because they were staring at a, computer, at a monitor and they were kind of looking at the data coming in. But this effect is uh, it's, it's very small. It's so small, it's about... It's 1 in 10,000 the size of a proton. So I'll say more about it next. 
So, so we saw this all wave front coming through and hitting us and changing the definition of lens. So how do we go after detecting it? So the way we go uh, after detecting it is through this, uh, this uh, uh, instrument that's called LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. This is an aerial view of one of the two observatories we have. This is in Washington State. Uh, this L shape, the arms are four kilometer long. Uh, the basic concept that we use is that of interferometry. Uh, so in that corner station, there is a laser light that gets split at a semi-reflecting uh, beam. It travels, rich mirrors, comes back, and then as the gravitational wave goes through, it changes the, the distance between the mirrors themselves. Uh, the laser light is monochromatic, so as the two uh, beams travel along the two arms, we set up things so that they recombine in a destructive interference, so that they exactly cancel each other. The gravitational wave came through, uh, effectively changed uh, the length of the two arms, and as the two did that, the two beams went out of phase. And so a little bit of light came out of the recombined beam, just like in this animation. So that's the effect we go after. We monitor that light spots and see if there is light coming through, and that's a sign that the relative length of the arms has changed. So that's the basic technique, laser interferometry. But again, just to give you a sense of how small that effect is, by how much these, those mirrors move. Um, just to give you a sense of the scale, um, I'm using here this comparison where we're zooming into an hydrogen atom. Okay, so this is the size of an hydrogen atom, 10 to the minus uh, 10 meters. So that's the electron. The nucleus of an hydrogen atom is 10 to the minus 15 meters. And the motion of our mirrors was one in 10,000, that, that separation. So that's the effect that we have been going after. So that's why this measurement is so difficult. This uh, stretching and squeezing the little jiggle dance are really, really small. And so uh, we need a very precise instrument. And that's what LIGO has been doing. So LIGO has two detectors. One is in Washington State, over here. The other is in Louisiana, down here. One is in the desert, the other is in the jungle. Uh, neither of them much of a fun place where to go and hang out and spend lots of time, but that's uh, that's a whole other story. Uh, they are 3,000 kilometers apart, and they're aligned along a, a great uh, circle. Um, so why is the distance important? Well, the gravitational wave travels at the speed of light, and so uh, you saw the wave coming and hitting Earth all at the same time. Well, it takes at most 10 milliseconds for a signal to come here and here. So uh, one of the key ways we can discriminate between a gravitational waves and just some local seismic activity, for instance, some local noise effects, is that the signal is to be seen here and here coherently at the same time and consistently be coming from a certain direction in the sky. Uh, the project is founded by the National Science Foundation. Uh, construction started in 94, completed in 2000. Two years later, we started taking data. This is when I started working on LIGO, so I guess it's 14 years. I'm actually pretty old in LIGO years, apparently by now it's only LIGO years. Um, and then we took data until 2010, um, and that was initial LIGO. Between 2010 and 2015, a lot of things have happened to LIGO. We are basically gutted, so we kept the same tubes, the same building, the same real estate, but we changed the laser, we changed the suspensions, we changed the mirrors, we changed almost everything, basically and started taking data again in September 2015. The first good quality data came on September 12, 2015, and our surprise came on September 14, 2015. Uh, we were all shocked, it came so soon, but anyways. Uh, this is a large collaboration, so John was mentioning earlier. Uh, it's, a, it's a thousand uh, collaborators across 80 institutions, 16 nations. Uh, what is Georgia Tech? Here, here I am. Um, and uh, maybe well, if, there, if you're interested in a question time, I can explain more about this. But there is a very, uh, it's really, I really enjoy working in this large collaboration because it's, uh, you know, with a thousand people, you get lots of strong-willed, stubborn people, but also lots of smart, uh, creative people. And so it's the input of, of all of this, uh, uh, these uh, competencies and all of this, uh, uh, the, the passion that drives all of us that made it possible to measure 
now something that 100 years ago Einstein himself said, forget about it. There's no way to measure something that small. Uh, but this was proven wrong. Wrong. So we proved Einstein right and wrong at the same time, if you think about it. <laughs> and so that's, that's also because of uh, the collaborative work with all these people. So uh, here is a graphical uh, layout of how many events has LIGO seen so far. So LIGO, Advanced LIGO took uh, data in its first uh, science run between September 12 and January 19 of last year. And we saw actually not only the one event that, uh, that was everywhere in the news, we actually saw another event that was our Christmas present. Nature is being funny, right? They, we saw non events, Christmas events. Um, we also had another event uh, that a candidate that we saw in October that was much weaker. So here we had two black holes of 36 and 29 solar masses that crashed, collided, left behind a 62 solar mass black hole. These guys were smaller, uh, and these two somewhere in between. Okay, so this is the layout of how, how many events we've seen in the first run of uh, Advanced LIGO. Um, this is a different way of looking at that. Um, so the discovery uh, of uh, uh, gravitational wave by LIGO is actually important in two different ways. One is, yes, we saw gravitational waves. We have opened this new window of the universe, and that was great per se. But the other big discovery that the astrophysicists are really excited about is that we didn't know that it's possible to have black holes that are so big. We know there are supermassive black holes at the center of the galaxy, a million times the mass of the sun. And we knew from X-ray studies that there are smaller black holes that are left behind from, the, from when, uh, you know, after a star dies, it collapses into itself and it leaves behind a black hole. So, some of those we knew they existed, but the fact that there are um, intermediate or, or large uh, black holes of the same order of magnitude as the sun, that was new. We didn't know that uh, for sure that there are stars so big that can leave behind black holes of this size. And so now understanding how uh, black holes that are 30, 40, 60 times the mass of the sun are possible, that's a whole new area of exploration. So this is the first uh, example of how this new information is now opening a new area of, of study. I also wanted to show you what the data look like. Okay, uh, This is a plot from uh, the discovery paper. And it shows over here, what you see here is uh, the signal. Remember that bright spot that was coming and going? So if we monitor that, uh, we, talk, we took our data and uh, we just filter low frequency and high frequency, so this just simply bump us. And this is the signal that was seen at Amford. So now the, the guys that were awake at 5 a.m. on September 14th, they, they just fell down their chairs. So I fell off my chair once I was having breakfast and looked at the email that came through because this is exactly what's expected to be the signal from the collision of two black holes. This is a, a simulation from numerical relativity. Numerical relativity is a branch of relativity that basically takes Einstein's equation, puts them on supercomputers, and solves those equations numerically to see what the gravitational wave that's produced. And this is the prediction. And this is the difference between the two. So it's uh, which is consistent with nothing. Uh, so, so here we could do an analysis by eye. This signal was so strong. Okay. And this is uh, a time frequency transformation where we see the frequency of the wave went up as the two black holes were going faster and faster and faster, and uh, up until the point of merger, and then there was a decay. This is what we call a chirp. You'll hear why in the next. Uh, meanwhile, in Livingstone, we got the same signal, but seven milliseconds later. So the delay between the two signals was seven milliseconds, which is consistent with the gravitational wave coming and hitting Earth, but coming from a certain area of the southern hemisphere. So um, these two really match very well. And so this is, again, the numerical relativity waveform, the residual, and the time frequency map. So this by itself is a really loud signal that we could see almost by the naked eye. And I've been talking about gravitational wave data analysis for many years before this, and I kept saying it's going to be such a weak signal, we're going to have to kind of go deep into, into the mud to pull out the signal. This was really loud and strong and clear, and, uh, and that's also why we also were so confident in it. So, um, wait, 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 I'll go back. So I now want to uh, let you hear what this sounds like. <laughs> 
Okay? So let's not get confused. Gravitational waves are not sound waves. They're ripples in space-time. However, when you take a signal that looks like this, and it's in the audio band, so hundreds of between 10 and 1,000 hertz, you can take this signal and put it in the speaker of your computer and listen to it. So it's like uh, the modern um, uh, phonogram, right? Uh, so we can now listen to what that sound was. So what you're going to hear now is the wave or the sound produced by those two loud events. And you're going to hear it twice so that you get used to it. But then I'm going to have it at, the, at its regular frequency and then shift it to higher pitch to hear better, just for, for ease of, of hearing. Uh, and so there we go. You're about to hear the yelping of black holes that were about to collide 1.3 billion years ago. That was it. <laughs> so now we shifted in frequency to hear better. So this happened 1.3 billion years ago, and that signal has been traveling all of that time up until the, the point of reaching Earth. And so that's the first time we kind of tuned in, tuned our radio uh, to listen to these sounds coming from the far, far distant space. Um, there are all sorts of other simulations. So, okay, so one may ask, are there other things that we can hear? Uh, so now I'm going to show you some simulation. That was real data. That's stuff that really happened 1.3 billion years ago. Now I'm going to show you some other simulations. Uh, this is a numerical relativity simulation that's showing the two black holes so, uh, that collide and then uh, collide. And you hear them too, actually. I'll just shut up. So that's kind of, if we track the longer waveform, that's the kind of information we can get. And this is a simulation, again. Uh, there are, in principle, if we decode that information, we can go back using simulation and understanding more of the properties of the waveforms themselves. So I'm just going to show you a few other examples for your listening pleasure. <laughs> so uh, let's see, I need to click here, right? So this is a merger of the two black holes themselves. Here is another case where we have a smaller black hole that's eaten up by a supermassive black hole, for instance. And so you're going to hear a qualitative difference between these two. So in this case, because there is a smaller one and a bigger one, you get all this wobbling in the waveform that has all that ticking that you heard up until the final chirp. And so by, again, um, interpreting and decoding the information in the waveform, we can say something more about how fast it was spinning, how big the were black holes, and so on. There are other sources that can produce gravitational waves. For instance, uh, we can go after uh, the signal that's coming from the collapse of a supernova. Now, supernova are a bit funny because how much gravitational wave is produced depends from the physical model that we assume. But um, you're going to hear this is very different, right? So just listen very carefully because it's going to be very short. So this is a, just a pretty image of the core collapse supernova. So the, the star explodes. It leaves, it leaves the light behind. The gravitational wave, that if you blink, you miss it, OK? That's it. So then we need to have more precise analysis to go in and go after that. And we don't even know what's the shape of the waveform for sure. But once we see one, uh, then we can go back and inform the physics. Uh, there are other sources that can produce gravitational waves. Uh, have you heard about pulsars? Pulsars are neutron stars, so what's left when a smaller star collapses. 
uh, that emits an electromagnetic jets and they spin around their axis. So if there are asymmetry or there are mountains on the surface of a neutron star, uh, then we, those can also produce gravitational waves. That's kind of like a siren. Here it is. It's kind of annoying. You can stop that. So can anyone guess how tall is a mountain on a pulsar? Millimeter. Roughly. I was, I was going to call here, but yes, kind of order of uh, a neutron star is, uh, you know, a sun squashed within uh, a 10 kilometer radius. And so the mountains there are structures that are millimeter size on the surface. And so that's the kind of effect that we can go after. And finally, once we become really good at decomposing the gravitational waves, we can go after the residual gravitational wave noise from all the way back to the Big Bang. And that's gonna sound something not that exciting like this. Right, but if we can find, uh, that's gonna go on forever. If we can find uh, kind of noise like this, that's kind of stochastic, but it's coherent in the two detector, then we can go and explore what happened in the first instance after the black hole. So in the first uh, 10 to the minus 43 seconds after the, the Big Bang. And so that's ultimately what we wanna be able to do, but that's gonna be a few years down the road. Uh, we're not the only ones that are doing this. Uh, so we have the two LIGO detectors in the United States. Uh, there is also another detector called Virgo that's being built in Italy. Uh, that's, that has comparable sensitivity and we're working very, uh, in very close collaboration. If you paid attention to my introductory slide, you saw that I was talking for both collaborations. So we're exchanging data, exchanging technology, uh, trying to synchronize our data acquisition. And so uh, they, um, they are our third detectors. Uh, there is one called Kagra that's been built in Japan and should become online in the, um, you know, at the end of the decade, 19, uh, 2019, roughly. And then there is uh, uh, a plan to bring in India uh, the similar detector to the LIGO ones, and so uh, that would be part of the LIGO network. Uh, and so at that point, we would have one, two, three, four, five different gravitational wave detectors. And you may ask, well, you have fine gravitational waves. Why bother? Um, so the reason is that with more detectors, first of all, we have a better coverage. But uh, more importantly, the more detectors we have, the more accurate we can point to where the gravitational wave came from. Uh, just to give you an example, um, these are, um, you know, with, with two detectors, we can um, point to where the source of the event was at best on a circle. So it's a delay in arrival time between the two. We can use more information on the waveform, become a little bit more accurate, but still our localization is really poor. So this shows you the, what we call it the error box for the localization for uh, the September event, the first one that we looked at. Uh, the Christmas event is almost on a circle. The other, these are very wide areas. Uh, we want to be able to tell our astronomer friends where the signal came from, because if they know where they came from, they can point and look and catch the electromagnetic waves, so that we have both gravitational and electromagnetic waves. Now, had Virgo been online at the same time, the error box for the uh, September event last year would have been much smaller. 10 square degrees instead of 600 square degrees. And so the electromagnetic follow-up would have been much better. So the more detectors we have, the better we can point at where the signal came from. Just like the more satellites that are out there, the better your phone can tell you where the closest Starbucks is. <laughs> so here, this is the beginning of multi-messenger astronomy, where now we have gravitational waves coming, for instance, for the collision of neutron stars, neutron star black holes, and then uh, our goal is to be able to send information that this happened to X-ray and gamma ray satellites, uh, neutrino experiments, uh, radio detector, uh, visible and infrared uh, telescopes. And so all of this information combined can give us the better picture. Remember the monkey movie? So uh, this is our Tarzan maybe hiding in here at the same time as we can see the images in the other windows. Right, so the idea is to have all of this information combined for a better picture of what happened out there. 
Um, this is a very ugly picture. I realize that, not as pretty as the previous one, but it's, uh, it shows a timeline for LIGO uh, measurements. So we took data last year. We are now in the middle of our second science run. So this was the projection that we're getting a little bit late, but, but it's, it's, it's in progress. So we are uh, taking our second science run, and Virgo is approaching the point of acquiring data themselves. So our hope is that in the spring, we're going to have two LIGO and the Virgo detector uh, taking data simultaneously. Uh, advanced LIGO is still being commissioned, so we, it's still not a full power. Uh, we're still, uh, you know, we're kind of tuning our knobs a little by little to get to full sensitivity. Uh, so the, the goal is by 2019 to have a full design sensitivity, and we expect many, many more of those events to be detected at that point. We're also not the only type of experiment that looks for gravitational waves. So um, the gravitational waves that we're looking at have a period of the order of milliseconds. It's in the audio band. There are other experiments that are probing different uh, gravitational wave periods or wavelengths. Uh, for instance, uh, LISA or ELISA is a, uh, it used to be called a space LIGO, it's not really LIGO, but it's, it's the same idea of taking an interferometer in space instead of uh, buildings we have spaceships that are in a triangular uh, configuration, they shoot laser astronomical units uh, from each other, and then they go after gravitational wave that's produced from the collision of uh, supermassive black holes, like the ones that are at the center of the galaxy. Pulsar timing array, uh, so their period is minutes to hours. The pulsar timing array is using pulsar timing, so the same pulsar that we were looking, probing for gravitational wave, they use them as clocks. And so a delay in the kind of modification in the time of arrival for the light from pulsars is also something that can be used for gravitational wave detection. There is now periods that are years to decades, so much slower signal. And then uh, you may have heard about BICEP, uh, last year, Planck, those are experiments that are looking at cosmological uh, gravitational wave production with periods that are billion of years, so things that happened billion years ago. So this is kind of a gravitational wave spectrum that in the next few decades we're, we're hoping to be able to probe, uh, to probe uh, um, in a more complete way. And so to conclude, I wanted to bring back, remember this was the first opening slides, uh, the image of the universe according to Apple, our visible universe. Well, uh, gravitational wave is now going to give us a different view of the universe, where now we know that not only there are catastrophic things happening out there, we also know that space is not flat, it wibble. And so our new vision of the universe is not that of a flat static thing, but <laughs> something where there are waves that propagate and decoding those waves is going to be another way to explore and understand the universe around us. Thank you. Okay, so here we go. Excellent. We'll have some time for questions. I want to make a few quick announcements. Uh, if you've been a regular at these events, you know, but if you're, if you're new to this, you can sign up for a monthly email to get a reminder. If you just Google Ohio State Science Sundays, there's an easy sign-up sheet. We're also starting to put some of these talks on YouTube, and you could look for Ohio State Science Sundays on YouTube. So uh, Laura's talk will be there, ideally, within a, in a couple of weeks, if you want to share it with your friends. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, we'll get your question in just a sec, sir. Last announcement is the reception today is in the third floor. Usually it's on the second floor. It's in the third floor in the cartoon room. So now we'll take some questions for Laura. But actually, sir, I'm going to start with anybody younger than 18. You notice I wandered over here. <laughs> you might have some questions. I don't want to put you on the spot. Think about it. Okay. You look like you're in the neighborhood. There was one back there, too. Okay, yeah. The, uh, the new LIGO being built in Kago, Japan, is that a, is the, is, so it's built under a mountain. Is being underground going to affect its, you know, signal? Please repeat, yeah. the, repeat the question. Yeah, yeah. So the question was, uh, 
I didn't say, but he did his homework. Uh, Kagra is the Japanese detector that I briefly mentioned, and that's being built underground, under a mountain. So the question was, is that advantageous? Why going under a mountain, right? So I have not really been saying much about uh, obstacles and noise sources for, for these measurements, uh, but the, the, one of the biggest enemies uh, that, that we have to fight against is seismic motion. So Earth is jello, okay? So things keep moving. And uh, um, you, know, you may think about earthquakes and traumatic things like that, but it's actually things like ocean waves or traffic on the turnpike, or, or these things are all kind of producing uh, noise that's the ultimate limit for how low a frequency can we go uh, and target. So initial LIGO, we couldn't go below 40 Hz because of the seismic wall. Advanced LIGO, one of the things we did was to change the suspensions and the, ins the, the seismic insulation so that now we can go to 10 Hz. Going underground, uh, well underground it's actually quieter. So um, that allows to move the seismic wall or the low fre frequency limit to order of 1 Hz. So, so it's really pushing the low end of the, of the noise spectrum. So going underground is, uh, it's, it's quieter. And so that helps uh, the sensitivity itself. There was okay, one back see. there that had been up for a while. Really? Oh yeah, there we go, go ahead. Yeah, just to wait. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, um, good question. So um, the question is uh, about the graviton. So what can we say about the graviton and its existence uh, from, the exi from gravitational wave measurement? Um, so the graviton, it's not so much the existence of the graviton. The one thing we can go after is what does the graviton as a mass, right? So the graviton, in principle, is the quantum of gravitational wave the same way as the photon is the quantum of the electromagnetic wave, right? Uh, so theoretically, you can formulate that. The question is, does the graviton have a mass? So, um, so far, from this event that we've discovered, uh, we have no evidence of a massive graviton. Uh, so the way we could see it, if, if the graviton has mass, then what happens is that lower frequency travels lower than the higher frequency. So the way we go after that is by looking at a deformation in the waveform where the lower frequency reaches faster than the higher frequency. And we have not seen that effect. So, so far we have set a limit on the mass of the graviton, which is, uh, I think, three or four orders of magnitude lower than the previous limits. So with more accurate measurements, we can keep shrinking that limit. But the, the mass of the graviton is what we would target. And again, so far we have not seen evidence for it. So I'm going to keep, I'll get to you in just a second, sir. I want to keep going to the students first. Go ahead. Uh, oh, yeah, that, that, pre that precedes my... Um, Repeat. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> How do we get to the side four kilometers versus three kilometers or 10 kilometers? Right. So this decision preceded my uh, LIGO lifetime. So what I've heard and what makes sense to me is that you need to come to compromises, right? So you wanna make uh, that length as long as possible. Limitation are how long is too far before you hit, you know, you need land, right? You need space that you, you, you build in. And even more, after a while, Earth is gonna start curving. So you need to correct for that, right? So there are actually, on the, people are on the drawing boards, they're thinking about much longer detectors that are 40 kilometers long. So that's being thought about. But the longer you go, the more expensive it is. So you need to kind of take into account costs, practicality, availability of land. And so back at the time, four kilometers was the, the, the number that came there. In reality, um, things are done. Um, so the, the laser beam actually does not really only go and come back. It bounces back and forth a few hundred times. So the effective length is not only four kilometers, it's order of a thousand kilometers by doing all this bouncing back and forth. And that's one of the gimmicks that allows us to reach that kind of sensitivity. We measure a strain, that's a gravitational wave, so it's delta L over L. And so one of the ways we can go so low is by making the denominator bigger. 
And so, but that's all done in optic. The, the physical layout was, was a combination of what was affordable. And another thing to keep in mind is those, va those tubes are under vacuum. So longer means more vacuum to be sustained. And already I think it's the biggest vacuum volume uh, in the world at that level. Okay, sir, go ahead. Right, so the question is, right, so the question is, what's the coupling between a gravitational uh, force and uh, magnetic force? Uh, so, so the coupling is probably there, but it's at the level that's much below our sensitivity. So the gravitational wave for our practical purposes kind of go through and are not uh, deflected by magnetic fields. Uh, and if there is an effect, is many order of magnitudes below our sensitivity. So it, it goes, you know, you hit the Planck limits before. Uh, that's the factor for us. So the magnetism is about 10 to the power 42 higher than the, magnetic, than the gravitational force. Right, but what matters for us is the interaction level, and that's much below what we are sensitive to. So. For our practical effect, we consider it um, decoupled, you know, from matter interaction or anything like that. So um, every effect is a much lower scale. Okay, just like let's take one more student. Actually, I have a quick question. How often do you get asked if people can have those sounds as ringtones? <laughs> uh, I, I, I think you can download it and do it. Actually. Okay. You're the first person asking me directly, but I think people have done it. Uh, okay. Let's go to the student first, and then we'll go. So what are practical application of the research? Um, so there are, there are two answers to this question, depending who you, are being, you, you ask. Um, so um, the, the implications are not direct. Uh, however, to build these detectors, there has been lots of uh, uh, laser science, material science developments, um, and so Applications are spin-offs of this that have not pumped out yet, but we think are gonna happen. Such as, you know, the GPS came as a spin-off of general relativity, and, and as that was being formulated, that was not in the books, right? So we do expect that some of this work in R&D, material science, mirror coating, suspensions, it may produce some practical applied uh, consequence, but uh, it takes a, a little bit of time for that to happen. Um, we're working with Google, you asked? Yeah, so um, we are actually, so far we have not uh, started working with Google. We, you know, there are people are considering ways to, you know, we have lots of data and supercomputers, and again, that, that's possible implications that some of the work we are doing uh, can be used. I think actually some of our authentication systems are now being used in colleges and universities, so the guy who set it up for LIGO is now doing it for schools. Um, so there are, there are things like this are, 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 are going to happen. Right now, uh, Google is not touching our data. Um, except I, use, I use Google a lot, but that's it. Sorry? Well, uh, in a way, I wish, because it would solve some of our funding problems. <laughs> the, the, the phone lines are open now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you my business card at the exit. <laughs> Sure. All right, let's take a question, sir. So you, you had mentioned um, a little bit about directionality. I'm interested in that, maybe more interested in distance and how you know how far away the signals are and where. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, the distance, um, so I've been saying these events were 1.3 billion uh, years ago. Um, so uh, the way we infer the distance of an event, it's really from the, its amplitude. Um, because, uh, uh, so for the, so you saw that waveform, right? Um, so things like the spacing between the peaks, the frequencies, all that tells us properties of, of the system. Um, so the, the mass of the black holes, the, the spinning of the black holes, and things like that. 
And once you have that, you know how much energy has been produced in the event. And so that's, then we know that we are sensitive to the amplitude, so energy is inversely proportional to the distance. And, uh, uh, and so that's, that's how we get uh, the distance of the events themselves, which is, uh, for those two, they both happen to be around 400 megaparsec, which plus or minus 20%. So the arrows are big. And so um, that's, at, at these levels, no, we, we do redshift corrections and the, and the like, but at this distance is still, the waveform is not distorted by that yet, yeah. Uh, that th so both of the loud events were coming from about 1.3 billion year, light years away, or 400 megaparsec. Uh, there was a one weaker event that was not loud enough to be a detection. For that, we estimated the distance as about uh, a gigaparsec, so twice as far, roughly, so three billion years. Uh, go ahead, and look right there. Um, I know that um, with objects and events on the scale of black holes, there is, uh, as long as there's like a, um, a disturbance in space, there's also a corresponding disturbance in time or light. Is there a corresponding disturbance in time or light with gravitational waves? Um, yeah, so I mean, if you can think of it as another dimension that also gets, uh, gets modified. So our detector is going at the projection of the signal in the space dimensions, if you think about it. Uh, time also got rippled, so we all got, uh, you know, larger and narrower, but also older and younger. <laughs> uh, you know, so the effect is also on the timing side, but what we go after is the uh, effect on the space coordinates. It's a, we pro, we pro, it's a, the measurement comes from a projection of the signal in the space coordinates. That makes sense. Um, the pulsar timing array that I was showing earlier, uh, that goes after instead of the effect on time, the propagation time for the signal. So it's, it's just a matter of when you're doing a measurement, you need to have an interaction between your signal and then instruments, and so we projected on the space parts. Um, so whatever happened to the time, we kind of lost that information. But it's, it's you know, it's by C. It's uh, just another coordinate. Just a second, okay. Hat guy. It's um, cool hat. My question was, you mentioned at one point that seismic activity was one that you based on interferences. Have you had any other segment? Yes. Yes. Um, Repeat. So uh, the question was, are there other noise sources or disturbances besides seismic activity that trouble us? Uh, and the answer is yes, there are several. Um, seismic activity is the biggest problem at low frequencies, so up to 60 hertz. Um, in the in initial LIGO, one of the problems we had was the thermal uh, noise due to the, the just random motions and vibration associated with temperature in the, uh, in the metal strings that the mirrors were suspended on. Okay, so, so in initial LIGO we had the mirrors were about this big and they were hanging on a guitar string. And so it was the thermal noise or the vibrations of the atoms in that string that were limits in the, in the, in the, what we call the buckets, in the most sensitive frequency, around 100, 200 hertz. Uh, so to change that, we have changed com the, the suspension system completely. Now we have, instead of having uh, guitar strings, I mean, there are guitar strings, but you get the idea, steel string, uh, we have a few silica fibers. So it's a very delicate system, but that, that's more, that's less noisy. Um, we have to be careful to the noise due to, um, again, thermal noise in the coating of the mirrors. So that, that level of, uh, of noise. And then at higher frequency, uh, our biggest source of noise is shot noise. So shot noise, for those of you who are not um, uh, dealing with this stuff, so basically it's a... Uh, so remember I had that, that flashing image that had no photons, some photons, dark, a little bit of light, dark, a little bit of light. Um, when you have just a little bit of light, uh, then there are fluctuations, statistical fluctuations in the number of photons that are eating your phototube. And so that fluctuation turns out being uh, a noise source uh, for most of the spectrum of LIGO. 
So uh, to address that, you need to put more power into the system, more photons, so that's less of a problem. But in doing that, things can become unstable. So the stability of the old system, that's also something we need to worry about. So we have, uh, that's a quantum noise. Another thing at low frequency, uh, we have to be careful to what we call radiation noise. So we have all this laser, all these photons coming from the laser that hit the mirror, they produce a pressure and tend to move it also. So yeah, so we have quantum noise from radiation pressure, quantum noise from photon statistics. Uh, we have uh, thermal noise, we have seismic noise. So yes, there are many factors. And then we just need to make sure that the whole thing is stable. Let's take, uh, ma'am, go ahead. Right, so the, the, the question is, um, um, uh, specific to Virgo, which is in Italy, how do earthquakes uh, and seismic, you know, the increased bigger seismic activity affects the performance for, for Virgo or LIGO the same. So earthquakes are, um, are their own thing. So that when I talk about seismic noise, I'm talking about constant, you know, vibrations that upconvert. Uh, the earthquake, when there is an earthquake, we actually feel earthquakes worldwide. We're actually probably one of the most sensitive earthquake detector networks. It's just that's what we're doing, but because we have seismometers too. It's not so much the detector, it's all the seismometers we have as monitors. And, uh, you know, those are long waves that travel through the earth as well. Uh, when there is an earthquake, we may just be brought out of lock, so we just stop taking data for a little bit. Um, and. Uh, uh, Virgo was more sensitive to the issue of, uh, of uh, seismic uh, activity. And so what they did is in their initial design, instead of having this uh, simple guitar string, they had a, a system that um, they called it marionetta, which is like a puppet. So it's a, the whole idea is to, to isolate the mirror from the motion of the ground, and they had it through this system that was kind of pivoting. Uh, we have now a system of quadruple pendulum, uh, so just it is, you know, the, gr the ground is going to move, but the mirror has to stay still. And so it's just how do we isolate that? And so they had to be, they were a little bit more creative from the very beginning um, through that. Uh, but again, the, the problem with the earthquake is, you know, it just happens and that's a big shakeup and then you just don't take data for an hour and then you start taking it again. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's no much worse than in Japan, for instance, at that point. Okay, let's take two um, final quick questions. You, sir, uh, gray shirt, yeah. yeah. I actually have two questions. Uh, you said that they got up to your right, but I think you said that they were in the same area. They likely were in the NIH, which is the question that they want, or on an LR. That seems to be what they're saying. And then another question I wanted to ask how you Yeah, so the first question, I guess it's more of a statement maybe than a question, was about the speed of travel for the gravitational waves. And uh, yeah, so that's part of, um, uh, of the prediction of, you know, in, in, in Einstein theory, it's this wave, the perturbation, it uh, it's, um, propagates like a wave at the speed of light, same as the electromagnetic waves. That's just the ultimate speed, uh, and if we go back to the example of the graviton, you know, if it's a massless particle, it travels at the speed of light. Um, that's so far consistent with what we have seen, and again, discrepancies will be seen in uh, the formation of the waveforms that we have not seen. So it's definitely something we will continue testing with more events uh, going on. Um, the other question was about uh, if, if the universe is, are there gravitational waves all the time? Are we living in a constantly perturbed state? And um, in a way, yeah. Uh, so the metric of space time is not ever flat. There's always some little perturbation. However, it could be so small that's not detectable. So, um, you know, every time we assume, you know, 
theories are never complete. Right? There's always the next step, something that our theory gets to explain and what's beyond. Um, so yeah, I'm not stretching and squeezing in front of you, uh, but I, I actually am, but to a level that's so imperceptible that it may just as well be none. Uh, if I drop this, which I'm not going to do or they're going to kill me, uh, I'm going to produce gravitational waves. Okay, because I drop this, this accelerates, heat smashes into the ground. The gravitational field produced by these objects and the floor is going to modify and that's going to propagate. But the effect is going to be so small that forget about it. So nothing on Earth can produce gravitational waves that's even remotely detectable. I didn't say much about this, but those... Those two black holes, they were, they released so much energy. So remember E equal MC square? So basically, by looking at the mass of the black holes before or after, we calculated that about three, the equivalent of three suns was converted in gravitational wave energy. Three suns, okay, three solar masses. And that happened in 0.2 seconds. And these objects that were 30 and 40 times the mass of the sun were rotating around each other at 0.6 c. C is the speed of light, so what's that? Two thirds of the speed of, of, uh, of light. So that was a pretty dramatic thing going on there. Okay, and we being nearby, we would have been stretching our length by, forget about this little vibration, by a fact, you know, I think I saw it, somebody who's six feet tall would become nine feet tall. Think about that stretching and then opposite. From six to nine feet. Oh, if you are at the horizon, which is uh, within 200 kilometers of the, yes. Oh, you just said last question. So, so anyways, uh, sorry to finish. So that always happens. We just, that's what we call the stochastic background and, and uh, uh, not something that we, we feel. Yes. Last sorry. question, Miss. Go ahead. So uh, the question is uh, building detectors on other planets and, and what would we have to, to learn from that? Um, well, the advantage of being in outer space is that we don't have uh, interference from, um, uh, from the motion of the ground. So as far as we are concerned right now, just being out in space like LISA is going to be, it's going to be affecting our sensitivity at, at low frequency. Uh, going on another planet right now, I, I, I don't think that would gain us much, much because we would be sensitive to the seismic activity on that planet itself. Um, so I think for, you know, because the waves travel and they're not, you know, it's not like we are in a more transparent area if you're in outer space. To all practical effects, you know, gravitational waves go through anything. So it's, um, it's not like we are gaining, uh, you know, by not having dust or things like that. So right now, just going out of Earth is a big step uh, forward. Okay, so let's conclude. Before we do, I encourage, I encourage you to um, come to the reception upstairs, and you have a chance to ask more questions. For example, what's it like to work with a 1,000 people for more than 10 years, the whole time with almost nothing in your hand, and then get a great present? And also, you, you can ask her about um, LIGO detections of the existence of giant underground creatures that burrow through the earth. <laughs> have, you, have you detected that yet? Oh, well, you can ask her yourself. Let's thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>